All right, we're off and running. Okay, so I've written down a number of passages from crossing the threshold between pages 100 and 160 that I have questions or comments about. Um, I'll start with one on page 100 where I feel like Whitehead talks about time in a way that doesn't feel consistent with how I'd been understanding his view of time. Um, so you wrote, contrary to Kant's claim that Euclidean geometrical knowledge is grounded synthetically in our formal intuitions of space and time, Whitehead grounds our knowledge of a uniform spatio-temporal nexus on an entirely different conception of the mathematical imagination. Quote, in the absence of space-time, there may still be consciousness aware of the truths of pure mathematics. It so happens that, in fact, we contemplate these mathematical truths in a temporal succession, but this order of precedence in our consideration of mathematics seems casual and irrelevant, so that we can easily imagine a timeless mathematical knowledge. In the same way, the idea of a spaceless mathematical knowledge presents no difficulty. Accordingly, this is Whitehead, we cannot maintain that knowledge in itself requires space-time, either as conditioning the mode of consciousness or as an essential system of relations interconnecting things known. Okay, so my question is, when he's saying we can easily imagine a timeless mathematical knowledge, is he saying we can imagine a state where all the many mathematical laws like become perceivable as a unity and therefore not requiring a sense of time to behold or un understand? And why is he trying to abstract knowledge from time here? I Because I've been feeling back in, when I think of causal efficacy, the way you write about it, the... Um, and, and that sense we've talked about that the primal mode of experience involves this sense that something has just come from the past into the present and is about to pass into the future. Um, but the way I'm reading Whitehead here, where he's saying knowledge doesn't require space time, we can disconnect these things. Um, yeah, why why is he doing that here? So... <clears throat> In, in Kant, we have this, this veil between us and the real and even between us and ourselves. And so even our own thinking, mathematical or otherwise, is going to be um, a function of our intuition of time. And Whitehead is aware of the discovery of non-Euclidean geometries and the refinement of mathematical logic far beyond what, what Kant, I mean, maybe Kant could have imagined it, but he, he didn't actually uh, foresee that um, physics would begin to explore higher dimensional um, and non-Euclidean geometries um, as having some relevance to the space and time of nature. And so that the fact that Kant had assumed Euclidean geometry was just the way we inevitably are going to experience uh, space and time. Um, the fact that that was proven to be incorrect is a clue to Whitehead that we need to go behind our normal spatial and temporal intuitions in order to grasp what the mathematical imagination is actually up to. And while for a human mathematician, yeah, we're always working out um, mathematical formalisms and, and solving equations and whatnot in time. But nonetheless, in principle, when we understand the, the meaning of the, of the equation, it, it's, it's true in a sort of eternal sense. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's not um, the fact that we have to work it out in a sequence is not essential to, to the truth of the, of the theorem itself. It's just that we came to apprehend it in, in that temporal sequence. So is he, is he, he comes into con he's saying when we come into contact with mathematics, we feel related to some, something 
outside of time, something eternal. It mathematics is it sort of proves to us that timeless truth can exist. And, and is is he pointing to that in some sense as as justification for his own attempt to um come up with a timeless metaphysical formalism? Well, if metaphysics is possible at all, there are certain true propositions that don't depend on anything spatial or temporal um, for their meaning. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Whitehead's not saying that he has arrived at any metaphysical propositions. It could be that everything that he has described in process and reality is a contingently emergent um, convenient way of categorizing things that's that's only relevant to our particular um, place and time or to, to this cosmic epoch as he would put it but he thinks our best hope for arriving at a metaphysical proposition which would be eternally true everywhere and always would be through mathematics he gives the example of the arithmetic statement one plus one equals two in process and reality. And, you know, that's the statement that uh, his book Principia Mathematica with Bertrand Russell a few decades earlier was also attempting to prove logically. But they uh, kept finding circular logic. They kept getting uh, stuck with these paradoxes of self-reference right. in an attempt to logically prove that one plus one equals two. And, you know, Whitehead's point in process and reality after the failure of the Principia to logically prove that um, is that, you know, that statement, as clear as it might seem at first, is actually quite um, vague. It, it hides a whole series of um, complexities and context. And he thinks that our particular universe has just barely arrived at that point where we can differentiate um, individual entities so as to be capable of learning how to do arithmetic mm -hmm. and that there, there might be universes where you know he says arithmetic would be a fanciful topic for dreamers but not, not something that would be practically valuable because the entities in that universe would just be the boundaries would be so fuzzy between them that we wouldn't even be able to distinguish one from one mm -hmm. uh, but that nonetheless the metaphysically speaking, um, we can intuit, intellectually intuit the meaning of one plus one equals two, an abstraction from anything spatial, anything temporal. Mm -hmm. But what Kant was saying, when he's saying our formal intuitions of space and time, we, we abstract from that geometrical knowledge, is he saying that in these forms we see, we isolate one from another, and from that, we get one thing, two thing, and that the idea of numbers occurs to us in response to our direct sensory input. Um, and and Whitehead is implying that, that, like you just said, there's a whole complex system of presupposition beneath the idea of one, and two and numbers um and and that is is more foundational or, or uh prior to uh, we bring that from elsewhere into our ability to isolate these forms as one or the other hmm. well it's almost like kant is saying that mathematical truths whether arithmetic arithmetical or geometrical are a function of our capacity for these pure forms of intuition spatial intuition is grounding geometry temporal intuition is grounding arithmetic mm -hmm. and so for kant number is a function of our experience of our own thinking in time and we can't get outside of that temporal succession uh, so as to understand number in its pure form. And mm. Whitehead's not saying that we can easily articulate or, or articulate, express number at all outside of time. But, you know, Kant denied what, what's called intellectual intuition, which is this sort of um, immediate grasp of 
our own thinking activity that wouldn't be mediated by by time or by space. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Whitehead's mathematical imagination was, you know, everyone was was shocked initially by these discovery, the discovery of non Euclidean geometries, but you could easily say the creation of non Euclidean geometries, because all you do is change the premises, and the axioms and say, well, parallel lines do meet at infinity. And all of a sudden, you know, you have a whole new geometry that spills out of that. And Whitehead was engaged in this process of refining mathematical reasoning um, to, to the point that he was comfortable saying that, yes, we can intellectually intuit the truth of mathematical statements as if uh, from the perspective of eternity, mm -hmm. even if our attempt to express any of that symbolically and communicate about it is, is going to still be mediated by space and time. Okay. So it's, it's a very, subtle point, but basically Whitehead ends up articulating an account of what's called projective geometry or topology that would be sort of like this, um, this form of mathematical, the, the articulation of mathematical extension that's prior to any particular geometry, to any particular way of measuring space or time, but you can derive all the particular, particular geometries from it. Okay. Well, so so when he's saying it's e we can easily in imagine a timeless mathematical knowledge, he's he's really just saying to to know there's consistency, to know there is this absolute system. It, knowing that doesn't take time. It's a it's a mm -hmm. system like it. Right. Yeah. And if I tell you I know it, or I try to describe how I imagined it, it's all going to be put into language that implies the flow of time yeah. and the expression is going to happen in time. But he's saying the knowledge itself isn't in time. Yeah. I get it. Okay. And this okay. follows from his, his metaphysical categories and the, the account of concrescence. There's a physical pole and a mental pole. And he'll say that the mental pole is not in time. Mm -hmm. The physical pole is in some sense in time related to prior occasions. The mental pole steps out of time and considers eternal possibilities. That's why he would say, okay, a God as a dipolar entity is flipped where the, the mental pole is primary, right. where everything else, because we come from that, we exist primarily on the physical pole. Okay. Okay. Right. Right. So in, in each moment of concrescence, when the mathematician is consciously considering some mathematical proposition there's a kind of communion with the primordial nature of god taking place which is a participation in the eternal ordering of possibility and we're ingressing some of those possibilities but then that moment of concrescence reaches its satisfaction and perishes and gives itself to the next moment and that's when time comes back into the picture mm -hmm. right and so when we're trying to maintain attention across you know whatever amount of time it takes us to solve an equation or something yes mm -hmm. it, there's no escape from the need to um you know come back into time to articulate the meaning of this proposition but the insight comes in the mental pole out of time and there's a way in which you know time and eternity for whitehead are um perp running perpendicular to one another in each moment like time is pushing us forward but eternity is constantly piercing in moment by moment mm -hmm. to give us that intuition mm -hmm. of mathematical truth okay okay that's great all right i'm going to jump to the next one you started with the most difficult question you possibly could have <laughs> well, hopefully that <laughs> it was on page 100 um <laughs> 114 okay even Hume, who explicitly denies the reality of causality because, he claims, the eye sees nothing but randomly arrayed patches of color, implicitly presupposes that the eye sees, that the organ itself physiologically participated in the causal transmission of feelings as light pours through the cornea, drains into the retina, and flows down the optic nerve toward the back of the brain. For Whitehead's philosophy of organism, it follows that, quote, in human experience, the fundamental fact of perception is the inclusion in the datum 
of the objectification of an antecedent part of the human body with such and such a behavior, an experience. Okay. In human experience, the fundamental fact of perception is the inclusion. Okay. So like what distinguishes our form of perception uh, is the, the, the form counterpart to the experiences we're perceiving. Okay. So continued, Whitehead accused modern philosophers, including Descartes, Hume, and Kant, of committing a set of related mistakes. One, they assume that the five senses are the only definite avenues of communication between human experience and the external world. And two, they assume that conscious introspection is our sole means of analyzing experience. The first mistake ignores the fact that, quote, the living organ of experience is the living body as a whole. The second mistake ignores the way that conscious introspection, though it, quote, lifts the clear-cut data of sensation into primacy, end quote, for that very reason, quote, cloaks the vague compulsions and derivations which form the main stuff of experience. So, Th that part, the, the, that quote, the living organ of experience is the living body as a whole. Um, would it be analogous to say, and I think you've said this in a way elsewhere, uh, you are your whole experience of an environment and the body is a particularly intimate part of that environment. Um, so so that that's the that's the living body. Um, and so when you're analyzing communication between living bodies, if, if you limit it down to um, the, the physical body and things you can observe as changing during the communication, just in the behavior of the physical body, you're, you're missing the overlap of, of the, uh, it like, the the two huge bubbles of experience also crossing as the little the little bodies that they beam into are looking at each other. There's all these other dimensions of interplay, um, and uh, and you know so how other people show up to you in the first place is already a direct avenue of communication, um, mm -hmm. given that you know you're experiencing them according to you. Um, and yeah, I, I wrote. I, I was just writing my impressions of that quote, and I said, uh, you know, it's it's like two two mirrors facing, um, where there's it's not when two mirrors face, you can't pinpoint this exact like ping pong of effect they have on one. There's sort of an instantly present, in infinite penetration both ways. Um, you know, mirror, 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 mirror. Um, yeah, there's, there's, yeah, a bottomless effect in both directions. Uh, mm -hmm. the second mistake ignores the way that conscious introspection, though it lifts the clear cut data of sensation into primacy for that very reason, cloaks the vague compulsions and derivations, which form the main step of experience that, I mean, that right there could be the matter with things that that's like the, that McGill, Chris, you know, that that's left, right. Um, that's what he's pointing to there, right? Just, yeah, the difference, but between analysis of the abstraction that for whatever reason we just we doing that tends to result in us forgetting the the living um ocean we we abstracted the things we're now analyzing out of mm -hmm. um yeah so you know whitehead's point one of his points here is that perception through our sensory organs and especially the eyes is already an abstraction from the full concreteness of experience and modern philosophers whether david hume or kant descartes have construed our situation as uh observers of the world as if there were a little man inside the head interacting with the data streaming in through the sensory organs you know, with the eyes, there's a screen projecting what the eyes see for this little man in our head. There's some speakers that are piping in what the ears are hearing. And so there's a sense of a disconnect and a mediation by the senses. And in Hume, when it comes to causation, Hume would say, well, what we really see on that screen 
of our visual perception is just patches of color. And once those patches of color come through the eyes and get into our mind, there's a process of association that goes on where you connect, you know, the, the colors and the shapes to produce the objects that we believe that we're perceiving. Mm -hmm. So causality then becomes just for Hume, a kind of custom or habit that we, um, we get used to seeing certain shapes and colors occurring together or occurring in succession. And so we say, ah, this causes that. Mm -hmm. Whereas for, for Kant, who wanted causality to have a little bit more necessity to it, not just being a function of habitual association, for Kant, causality becomes a category that thinking adds. Um, rather than for Hume, it being just a habit for Kant, it's, it's a necessary category that we have to think about our sensory experience in terms of. Just for, the, the distinction between category and habit. Yeah. Can a you, habit is contingent. It's just sort of a psychological construct, right? Whereas for Kant, he's saying, no, this is logically necessary. We have to experience the world in terms of causal relationships. Okay. And he says these are necessary and universal because, you know, Kant was really trying to save the possibility of scientific explanation, mm -hmm. which, which depends on this idea of causality, necessary connection the basis for laws of physics and so on. Whereas mm -hmm. Hume was saying, well, a law of physics is really just a function of, of our tendency to associate certain occurrences, but we don't know for sure that that law is going to continue into the future. Whereas Kant is saying, no, we do know for sure because we can only experience the world according to our categories. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's both Hume and Kant are in some sense accepting a more subjective point of view on knowledge. It's just that for Hume, it's contingent in particular to our habits, whereas for Kant, the way we subjectively perceive the world is necessary and universal. All subjects have to experience the world this way. Mm -hmm. And what Whitehead does is say, look, causality isn't something added later by the mind, whether out of habit or by the imposition of a category. Already in Hume's statement that we see these patches of color with our eyes, that withness of the eyes that Hume's referring to is an experience of causal transmission. We're feeling the transmission of that, of visual feelings mm -hmm. through our eyes into our nervous systems, right? And the eyes are a difficult um, organ system and, and, and perceptual modality to notice this because there's, there's, this sense of a world projected out there around us um, in a three-dimensional um, display by by the eyes. But if we think about a, a more um, bodily sense like touch, it's much more obvious that um, that we're in direct contact with the causal vectors of the world. And Whitehead wants to invert the picture of this little man in the head observing the world only through these um, the, the openings of the senses, the five sense organs, and instead make a different kind of, of perception, which he calls bodily reception, more primordial. And he thinks the philosophers have ignored this more visceral form of feeling to focus on the five senses because, you know, the eyes again, in particular, are capable of giving us clear and distinct edges around things. And so, it's more amenable to a kind of conceptual analysis. Whereas these vaguer feelings of, of causal efficacy and, and the, the visceral uh, transmission of feeling throughout the body, it's, we can't really conceptualize it as clearly. And so philosophers have focused on, you know, it's kind of like the story of the guy who loses his keys and only looks for them under the, um, the street lamp where it's illuminating um, that place, right? And so, if we only look where the light is and pretend like nothing else is, you know, really there, like the keys might be hiding in the shadow over there, but we're not going to look because we can't see in the shadow. So the feelings of the viscera have been ignored by modern philosophers because they preferred clear and distinct ideas given to us by our five senses. And Whitehead is inverting that picture and saying, look, the, our closest contact with reality comes through vague feelings of the, emotional tonality that's that's filling a room you know when we walk into a, a conversation that's already going on like we can feel the vibe 
and only then do we, you know, he, he uses another example, like, you know, a man does not begin dancing with um, shapes and patches of color and then proceed to conjure a woman as a dancing partner. It's like, no, he's dancing with another person who he has this immediate sense of, um, of contact with as a person. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, your connection to the McGilchrist, I think is appropriate here with, you know, the right hemisphere sees the whole first perceives the whole first the, the left hemisphere begins with analysis and thinks that it can then assemble holes out of parts but a part is not just an assemblage of, of a whole is not just an assemblage of parts mm -hmm. it has it has its own being which precedes the analysis of it into parts mm -hmm. and whitehead's trying to restore a sense of this holistic perception by you know, rediscovering a mode of perception that in terms of causal efficacy that modern philosophers have been blind to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he describes the human body as a complex amplifier right. of the right. throbs of emotional energy. Right. right. And so, you know, Whitehead talks about a statement Descartes makes where in Descartes sort of attempt to phenomenologically describe his own experience. He says, the mind feels like this body is mine. And Whitehead corrects Descartes and says, what he really should have said is that this world, this actual world is mine in the sense that, you know, as you put it, the body is only a particularly intimate part of the environment for our conscious experience. And so the boundary between the body and the world becomes, um, you know, somewhat arbitrary. I mean, yes, there's the skin boundary and uh, we don't feel pain when, you know, we smash a rock, but when a rock smashes into us, we feel it when, it when it touches our body. But nonetheless, you know, in Whitehead's understanding of the nature of the universe um, as a process, a relational process, every occasion of experience is bringing forth not just a new perspective on an already existing world, it's in a sense bringing forth a whole new world, right? And adjacent actual occasions of experience, as they arise and perish into one another, as this these the you know image of reflecting mirrors that you were talking about um, kind of captures that. Then you know our worlds overlap, but the world is constantly growing with each drop of experience arising to take a new perspective on what had come before and then perishing to itself become part of that world that then gets taken up by the next perspective which arises and so you know the world is an extension of our own body and our perception our organs of perception the living body as a whole right is the organ of perception as whitehead says which means that you know we are in direct contact with vector feelings in whitehead's terms um, or these pulses of emotion that are flowing into us from the surrounding cosmos. And what makes our body and the skin membrane and the medium of the senses uh, important is the ways in which they amplify those vectors streaming in from the extra bodily environment, right? Mm. And so, yeah, he, he thinks of the body as, as a, um, it's a filtering process, it's an amplifier, and it's, it's giving us a sense of what's important in that um, array of influences streaming in from the body or from the environment, allowing mm -hmm. us to, um, you know, interpret it for the sake of not only our own survival, but our own enjoyment. Mm -hmm. So the body's the highest density amplification. And, and, when, mm -hmm. and when you say the environment is an extension of our body, it might even work, work to say uh, the environment is our body as extension and 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 this uh this sense of things streaming in we get that that image of streaming in from our sense that there's a a central point of complex amplification that mm -hmm. like it you know, the further you look away, the blurrier it gets. The sense that, you know, things clarify close to this, both visually right. 
Mm -hmm. Right. And I mean, just to be a little bit more concrete about it, it's like we couldn't walk without the ground. Like, yeah, we have muscles and bones and stuff that allow us to, you know, traverse uh, the surface, but without the ground there to hold us up, to meet our feet, we couldn't walk. The, the air that we breathe, you know, it's a great example of the porous boundary between what's inside our body and what's outside our body. I mean, we're constantly exchanging um, molecules of air with, with the environment around us. And so our lungs couldn't do a damn thing without the atmosphere. So where's the body begin and end? I mean, from moment to moment, and then there's the process of eating and defecating. It's like, you know, we are a, a, a way in which the environment has organized itself to intensify its experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this all, this connects to aesthesis, which mm -hmm. I, so page 120, aesthesis for the ancient Greeks. Am I pronouncing that right? Aesthesis, yeah. Okay. Aesthesis for the ancient Greeks was related to the circular passive activity of breathing. We breathe in sensory impressions of the cosmic surround, and thus inspired, we breathe out creative expressions. The universe is then not merely our environment. Rather, it enters into and rhythmically transacts with the very heart of our being, beckoning us to partake in the call and response of the cosmogenetic ensemble. Quote, there is an inflow and outflow of factors between the bodily actuality and the human experience, so that each shares in the existence of the other, end quote. For this reason, Whitehead continues, the human body provides our closest experience of the interplay of actualities of nature. Steiner describes the yogic breathing practices of ancient India as an attempt to become more conscious of the way these aesthetic bodily rhythms bind us to the wider cosmos. Human beings, according to Steiner, quote, find themselves oriented in a curious way between image and reality. So a couple thing, things. As, uh, aesthesis and aesthetic. I, I've heard... Um, it's the word aesthetic all through philosophical writing. And I, I don't know if I ever fully understood what it meant other than something appreciated mainly for the, the first impression it makes visually really is how I think of aesthetics. Um, and through, mm -hmm. through reading this section, I got more acquainted with the concept as of course, related directly to breathing. Um, where right like we just read something coming in going out and it so is the idea of an aesthetic something that has ach achieved an aesthetic like in art is that it does that still connect um insofar as it's it's like something is expressing back what it's what it's taken in so like a, a certain style of clothing in hip hop might be considered like the, the environment had an effect and then the organism took an out breath in the form of like expressing it in this personal way. Mm. Um, I, I, so, so that, that was the uh, connection I made there. And then the idea of the significance of breath, for getting us in touch with the nature of reality, um, the connection there became clearer to me because I think I, I might have tended to think of breathing in relation to meditation as you're simply calming the body and that calms the mind. Um, and then you're able to perceive more clearly without all that mental activity. And of course, that's true to an extent, but getting closely in touch with the breath seems like Steiner is um, implying uh, it. It's like breath is our it is the uh, is a, is the expression of that the truth of that circular interplay. It's not, it's not just, oh, this is how you calm the body to calm the mind. Yeah. It's by getting intimately acquainted with that, that motion of in, out, in, out. Then we become, we become more, 
in, in touch with that rhythm of interplay um, between inner and outer. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there's also a way in which this relationship to the rhythms of the cosmos and between the rhythms of the cosmos and the rhythms of the human being, being whether breathing or the wake sleep cycle, um, the way that this evolves over the course of, of human history, there's an evolution of consciousness here. And so just as in, in sleep, when we are breathed, we don't consciously breathe anymore. We're, we're not awake. Breathing happens to us for these ancient, um, civilizations that Steiner's talking about the Vedic, the Indian civilization of, you know, thousands of years ago, there was, and for, you know, indigenous people generally, there is a sense in Steiner's view in which thinking is something that happened to them, almost as if they were perceiving the thoughts of the cosmos and thereby being almost given the meaning of the world, just as we in sleep inhale and, and, um, and exhale, so the, the, the meaning of the world is, would be inhaled for this more participatory form of, of consciousness and expression of it is exhaled, but it happens as if a, a, in the same way that breathing happens when we're asleep for mm -hmm. us nowadays. And what happens over the evolution of consciousness and Steiner's view is that gradually thinking becomes less and less something akin to perception and more and more independent more and more something we as individuals have to do ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that leads to an increasing sense of alienation from the meaning of the world to the point nowadays, I think we're, I think we're just past this, um, this point, actually I'm beginning to recover this, but, you know, as materialism becomes the dominant um, mode of, of explanation in the sciences and in culture generally, we feel as though the world has no meaning and any meaning it does have is something we're projecting onto it with our thinking, mm -hmm. right? So I have my worldview and you have your worldview and like what's really true is just, you know, kind of up for grabs. Whoever has more power to impose their worldview, that's what's true. But we have lost because our thinking has become so active and individualized um, and in some sense free of the, the, objective meaning that would just be given to us by the world um we've we've lost the capacity to take seriously the idea that the universe has any meaning at all and what whitehead is inviting us to do and what steiner calls for is a new form of participation whereby we consciously engage our free thinking activity to reconnect with those those deeper rhythms of the cosmos mm -hmm. And, you know, Steiner would say he was always cautious, actually, about trying to, to learn some of these ancient breathing techniques and yogic techniques, because he thought that actually would bring us back into a kind of um, original form of participation, which would, which would mean losing our conscious free thinking activity. And he wants us to keep that free thinking activity and not try to participate in this in terms of a breathing technique, but to participate in terms of a, a new form of imagination, ultimately, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the, one of the core threads of, of my book, where we're consciously freely deciding uh, to, to restore connection to those, those cosmic rhythms, rather than being breathed by the world, we consciously um, sort of become responsible for, for that breathing ourselves while, while wide awake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you say uh, attending to the imaginal tides of his thesis as they flow to and fro across the sublime edges of embodied experience helps bridge the otherwise gaping chasm between mind and matter. Attending only to conceptual thought or to transcendental structures artificially widens the gap. Dwelling instead upon the way aesthetic and emotional vectors vibrate sympathetically through and between bodies, we begin to realize that modern philosophy's abstract categories of mind and matter no longer hold any water. They leak. I mean, that, that's great in a lot of ways, but connecting it to what you just said, a, a, a way of thinking about that would be meditation, um, I think we we've, we've touched on this a bit in prior conversations. The idea of a meditation that 
isn't based on recognizing the lack of an agent um as as you watch the imaginal tides and realize oh i'm not really doing this that would be the kind of regression that someone might worry about where like you that might be very pleasant but in some sense it is a regression to an earlier state of consciousness where thoughts felt like they were being thought for us um and that it it is a, a valuable capacity we we've realized in ourselves to steer the ship and so the breathing exercises are still beneficial as long as there's a spirit of something being cultivated, not merely recognized. Would that be accurate? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a matter of overcoming the alienation, which has resulted from this individuation process, whereby thinking becomes something I claim as my own and is not just streaming in from the world. We don't want to get stuck in that sense of separation and alienation, mm -hmm. but we have to move through it and not just try to undo it, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? We have to remain individuals that freely choose to come back into communion with the world, mm -hmm. right? Rather than that just happening, that communion happening automatically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quote, the philosophy of organism is the inversion of Kant's philosophy, according to Whitehead. While Kant endeavors to construe experience as a process whereby, quote, subjective data pass into the appearance of an objective world, Whitehead's philosophy of organism describes experience as a process whereby the order of the objectively felt data pass into and provide intensity for the realization of a subject. In short, in Kant's philosophy, quote, a merely apparent world emerges from the subject. While for the philosophy of organism, the subject emerges from a real world. Okay, I think we we have we have covered that, and I do I do have a grasp of what's going on there to you know to the extent that I can right now. So I'm actually going to jump to my next quote, page one twenty two. On Whitehead's reading, Kant privileges perception in the mode of presentational immediacy and ignores or at least marginalizes the deeper and more ontologically relevant perceptual mode of causal efficacy. The question about the term causal efficacy, I, I think I understand what it means, but the, uh, the way I think about the words in relation to what they mean, I think of um, that, that primal emotional mode of something from the past has just streamed in and I'm now the expression of it and I have some freedom to choose something in the future. Ca that being described as causal efficacy, I think of it, it being characterized as a process of, of discerning what will most effectively realize my cause. Um, and that makes sense to me in a way, because we are talking about those more subtle, ephemeral, walk into the room, feel the vibe sensations, but they still come with, I've, I've inherited something I need to now aim. And there is a sense of trying to find the most effective means for realizing my cause. I, I listened to your most recent conversation with Tim Jackson and I, and you were criticizing free energy principle thinking based on its instrumentalism and the circularity there whereby uh you know a a, a brain is describing a brain as being something instrumentalist in that it's trying to control and predict yeah. Um, and you were distinguishing that view of the whole process being driven by that desire to control and predict with Whitehead uh, and, and process philosophy and um, presumably uh, knowledge in the mode of causal efficacy. But then there's something about that terms, causal efficacy, that also mm -hmm. has that instrumentalist feeling to it. And I'm, I'm sure. curious about the, the distinction there. Yeah. 
So instrumentalism in science would be this idea that science isn't really telling us what the world is independent of its form of interaction with the world. It's just coming up with models that help us to more effectively control and predict how the world will behave if we poke it and prod it in specific ways. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that Whitehead in, see, that's an approach to science that just says, look, metaphysics is, and the understanding of reality, ontology even, is not something we should concern ourselves with. We need to leave that behind. We're just brains that have evolved to make better predictions about what's going to happen next to survive, right? And so the idea of, of truth in some ultimate metaphysical sense just goes out the window. And what matters is, does it work mm -hmm. for the purpose, whatever the purpose is that we have in mind as the criterion, does it work to, to meet that purpose? Um, and the purpose would be, yeah, prediction and control. And, you know, Whitehead as, as a metaphysician is trying to remind scientists that um, truth should be of value to you and not just truth as what works. Now, you know, there's a close relationship between instrumentalism and uh, pragmatism as a philosophical school of thought. Yeah. And, you know, so people like William James and John Dewey would, would say that, you know, when you have a concept um, of anything, its meaning is actually the the way in which you will come to apply it in the course of your experience um, in life. And so its meaning is its use in that sense. Mm -hmm. What does that concept allow you to do, whether in conversation with other human beings or in engaging the world, right? And if the concept proves to be helpful, um, then it's true enough. And, you know, Whitehead is not dismissing that whole way of orienting ourselves toward truth as a kind of use value. Mm -hmm. But we still need to have behind that a deeper metaphysical account of the truth relation as such. And Whitehead would define truth as, I mean, his simplest definition of truth is, is the confirmation of appearance to reality. And so in any experience, Whitehead wants to be able to establish something in it, which is objectively real that that the experience is conforming to, um, as well as to leave room in experience for um, a, a non confirmation, which would be a, a, a source of novelty, we can interpret our experience otherwise. But the problem that I was trying to get at with the free energy principle and the sense in which it can almost seem like it's suggesting a kind of solipsism and again like a little man in the head that based on sense data is making guesses about what might happen next but but the sense data it's receiving is just it's the projection on a screen and and a speaker piping in you know sound from the environment and there's a sense of disconnect there as if we're not in causal contact with the world around us and so whitehead wants to both acknowledge this pragmatic account of truth as use value but also ground that in this metaphysical account of truth that that shows in his theory of perception how we are in causal contact with the world. Okay, and, so this is this is precisely what we began by talking about in, yeah. in some ways. Because he's because by uh yeah, ma mathematics as as no knowledge outside of time, allowing us to understand that knowledge doesn't require time, meaning that anything instrumentalist that's based on cause and effect, get this, that that all plays out in time, but it can't be the fundamental truth because it's bound to time. Yeah, yeah. And, and there are always these paradoxes of, you know, here we are as scientists trying to explain the nature of thought and, and cognition and perception in terms of this free energy principle. But we have to, if we're going to claim that we have to, in, in the background of our imaginations have some theory of truth and criterion of truth by which we could even claim that this is how the brain functions. Yeah. And so we're, 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 or, or we're just saying that this model is, um, is itself just, you know, true if it proves to be useful for prediction and control, but you get stuck in this loop of, um, an infinite regress of justifying 
the use value of the theory because it's useful instead of having a real theory of truth whereby you could verify it, it as true, right? Mm. And so, you know, uh, Whitehead makes this comment that I think is quite applicable to some of the proponents of the free energy principle, where he says that some people express themselves as though brains and nerves were the only real things in an entirely imaginary world. Yeah. Right. So we take the brain as real, but anything that the brain tells us about the world is just a hallucination from, from the free energy point of view, which how do you know the brain is real if everything, because you only perceive the brain through your senses too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tim mentioned a Karl Popper quote that natural selection is a metaphysical research program and not a falsifiable hypothesis. Mm -hmm. He was saying that things you were saying, he wasn't you know, saying he necessarily agreed with that, or maybe he did. Yeah. Um, is that So natural selection is a metaphysical research program and not a falsifiable hypothesis. Um, is that... Is that does that relate to what you were just saying about um, hmm. the uh, oh, I'm getting a little lost here. So yeah, well, so to say, so you know, evolution by natural selection is is a a theory that logically speaking is almost tautological in the sense that you know we when we ask the question, well, why does this particular species exist? today in the way that it does well it's because its ancestors survived mm -hmm. in the past and so it survives today because it survived in the past okay but if you if you think about it not in that strictly logical sense but as a kind of narrative it's mm -hmm. a kind of narrative explanation that we can account for the way things are now by understanding events which have occurred in the past and led up to this present um then you know it starts to become as you know and Dennett likes to say a universal acid, like you can explain everything mm -hmm. through natural selection. Um, just as, you know, you could uh, explain everything about human behavior through Freudian psychoanalysis. But when you get these global explanations, they're very powerful, but at the same time, as Popper is pointing out, you can't really falsify them. What would count as disconfirming evidence of that? Um, well, you pointed to how, uh we have organisms whose experiences have become more complex uh, and they and have become more sensitive, but much more fragile throughout the process of evolution. Right. And, it, right. and it seemed like you were pointing to that as in a way, a, a way of falsifying natural selection to, to a degree, natural selection in terms of um, survival being. Yeah. I think the, it, it shows the limitations of the account of speciation by natural selection because if that were the only factor at play you wouldn't expect to see more complex more sensitive organisms that were comparatively deficient in survival value mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right if if survival is the name of the game and that's it um then we shouldn't be here like you know and tim quoted whitehead as saying you know the art of persistence is to be dead right mm -hmm. the rocks survive for billions of years right and so matter if matter complexifies only as a result of natural selection you're you're left without an account of yeah why organisms of comparatively deficient survival value would ever have emerged how, so it's how, not that it's contradicting or falsifying natural selection it's just there's clearly more more going on right. um, because you could say just by virtue of the fact that we are here, that even if it appears to us that mainly what's been going on is we become more sensitive with less uh, obvious survival value. I mean, we are successfully surviving, in fact. And so I guess it's still it, it goes to your point that natural selection isn't falsifiable because anything that's here, could be, well, it, it is surviving. And so right. anything it does, as long as it's still here and we can observe it is further evidence for natural selection. Right, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, all right, page 122. Oh, uh, sorry, let me jump in. Page 124. That Kant was unwilling 
per his devotion to the good, capital G, to allow aesthetic feeling, beauty, or scientific knowledge, truth, an equal share in critical philosophy's transcendental foundation, follows from his desire to subjugate the faculties of thinking, theoretical reason, and feeling, taste, or aesthetic judgment, to that of willing, practical reason. The moral law derived from his critique of practical reason was Kant's keystone. He denied knowledge of nature in order to make room for freedom. He thus gains experience of the formerly supersensible nature of freedom, but remains insensitive, or at least unwilling, to acknowledge the ontological significance of our imaginal experience of natural beauty. Fearful of the sublime power of imagination, Kant restricts the mind to representations of a dead nature manufactured by fixed categories of the understanding. I th this this image of Kant um, as that 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 you paint in several different ways really compelling of, of it, like him having gotten to the edge of him having gone on a very noble and very helpful journey, but then gotten to the edge, gotten a sniff of the chaos of creativity, and reeled back in fear and sort of taken it as further confirmation that we we need to live in our bubble of order and almost like wanting to cling to the sense like we can never get outside of this thing because like I don't want to get outside of this thing um is that is uh, well let me let me finish the quote um Schelling and Whitehead were initiated into the lower transcendental mysteries of philosophy by Kant but they did not stop there they pressed on to imagine a living way of relating to reality. Unlike Kant, who indeed discovered but dared not disturb the creativity at the abyssal root of mind and nature, Schelling and Whitehead made it the lamp guiding their plunge into, into descendant philosophy or descendental philosophy. Um, but you do, you know, so there's there's that image of Kant as having gotten to the edge and then uh, reeled back in fear. And then this image of Schelling and Whitehead who, you know, were, were had the courage to delve deeper. But it but but the fear is is not unfounded. Uh, you know, it said uh, uh, this connects to another thing I wrote down about how we risk madness. Philosophy is the negotiation of madness. Reason's ongoing encounter with what resists reason. That's what Schelling said. Um, you said, in this way, Schelling challenges the orthodox orientation of philosophy toward the intelligible by affirming that a certain kind of madness lurks within or behind intellect itself, giving it life. So there, there is a do you, you know, you get that sense when you read someone like Carl Jung that you feel the flirtation with madness um, in a way that maybe is harder to detect in writers like Whitehead and Schelling? Because Whitehead, you you're, you get the sense that you're reading this um, this complicated system that and, and you're not entering into a dream. Um, that's that's what it feels like, but you're much more intimately acquainted with his work and can probably feel more of the man as a result beneath the words. Um, do you sense a, a flirtation with madness in in him any more than any other philosophy philosopher? Um, is that is that a feature of his work or or is that statement by Schelling? It's it's general, but we don't see it um, on display all that much. I mean, Whitehead presents as such a polite English gentleman, um, and sort of is Victorian in his in his manner and his uh, morals. I mean, he, he's his philosophy is so much more radical than than he seems to have been. Mm. And you know, I'm always asked, like, well, what 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 does he say about his like mystical experiences or ecstatic experiences of union with the cosmos and so on? And he doesn't say anything about that. Um, you know, he, the closest he he gets is is when he expresses his love of Wordsworth's poetry, which is this very you know sublime expression of uh, of union with with the the divine through the natural world. But I think it's it's in Whitehead's account of creativity 
as the source not only of of the world of all of our thoughts and feelings but of god even the god is a creature of creativity it's those sorts of statements which suggest that there is this 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 profound comfort that whitehead was able to find in a groundless reality in a in an a reality which is doesn't have a foundation underlying it, but which is itself just an infinite fountain, you know, is how I put it in the book. It's, it's just an ongoing advance, never the same twice. And, you know, to feel comfortable in that sort of a universe requires some courage and it requires also some humility because it means that it's not that knowledge becomes limited in the way that Kant thought it was limited. It's that knowledge becomes something ever ongoing and that will never be finished knowing more. <laughs> There's always more to know, right? Um, and so that flirtation with, with madness, I think it's clearer in Schelling's writing and it bursts right onto the page in Nietzsche later who <laughs> yeah. himself really i think did he lost himself in the confrontation with this mm -hmm. and he didn't have the um the community of of peers to help support him in and, and he didn't have the immediate recognition i think he was recognized later for what he was able to uncover and and articulate but at the time there were there was no one who understood him mm. um and so he did go mad and you know you see in Jung the the cultivation of this form of consciousness that is comfortable in the unconscious and comfortable with chaos and has this basic sense of trust or faith even in in the unconscious in the imagination that while it may dismember you it will also reassemble you if you if you stick with it um and so you know jung who's inheriting this whole mode of thought coming out of um german idealism at least the schillingian more romantic um branch of german idealism not so much the hegelian more rationalist branch but you know in jung you, you really start to get the sense that those who go crazy are the ones who can't acknowledge that they're mad and like they they refuse to accept that they're they have this little bit of madness in them and then in resisting it that's when you really crack up like that's when the psyche becomes fragmented when you resist and pretend like that madness isn't there lurking in the in the crevices of your unconscious but if you can if you can just accept that and go with the flow and and have that basic sense of trust in the unknown trust in the darkness then you reach this deeper form of wisdom mm -hmm. but it requires the confrontation with nihilism right first yeah yeah 137 you said we can as Schelling put it quote grasp the god outside through the god within as the source of the beautiful is infinite, no conceptual definition can capture or explain it. We cannot reach beyond or behind beauty's inner and outer appearances to grasp the rules governing its aesthetic genesis. When we try to peer beyond the cosmos outside us or plumb the depths of the psyche within us, we find only more appearances, an infinite regression of appearances. When the understanding tries to reflectively grasp the infinity of his thesis, it slips into an infinite regression. It fails to find an original ground or fundamental reason for the ongoing aesthetic genesis of the chaosmos. Only the creative imagination can intuit the meaning of the infinite aesthetic ingression of beautiful appearances. So that's exactly what you were just saying. It's that that confrontation with the infinite regression and then the the horror of that inability to grasp that feeling of, of falling into that infinity and there's no final answer to like but why um but the 
you know, and, and you connected later. Nietzsche said something about how, um, you know, he, uh, he, he, that the, holding the the feeling that there's no meaning, um, you, he he didn't want to accept it as true, but then got to a place where he um, he saw it as a naive overgeneralization to say that because his reason couldn't grasp what was going on that there or couldn't find meaning that therefore no meaning exists and that that connects back here to um that that idea that only the creative imagination can intuit the meaning of the infinite aesthetic ingression where it is there's that there's no answer to the big but why in the form of a of a propositional response but if we're more closely inhabiting that realm of causal efficacy or or creative imagination um there there's a felt there's a felt justification it it it, it, it it's a kind of infinite knowledge like mathematics that like it isn't a knowledge that requires and again then we'll try to express it it'll fall into time like everything else but there's a there's there's a source of that acceptance um that yeah you like you said it results in a in a deeper kind of wisdom page 141 uh in affirming the process of reality as aimless Nietzsche finds himself stuck in a sort of nihilistic stasis, unable to deny meaning altogether. Okay, this is what I was saying. Quote, one cannot endure this world, though one does not want to deny it. Nietzsche thus comes to see nihilism as, quote, a pathological transitional stage. Okay, that's, yeah, what I meant by naive overgeneralization. Quote, what is pathological, Nietzsche continues, is the tremendous generalization, the inference that there is no meaning at all. In other words... Once the three traditional categories of reason, aim, unity, being, have proven themselves incapable of capturing the dynamism of the actual universe without remainder, quote, I mean, uh, in parentheses, applying instead to a mostly fictitious ideal universe projected by our psychological need for existential security, there remains the constructive task of reevaluating the cosmos in accordance with more adequate categories. Adequate not according to the standards of transcendental reflection, which construes reality through only human consciousness, um, provides, quote, the meaning and measure of the value of things. Rather, categories adequate to the standard of life itself, namely the will to power. In Nietzsche's words, in order for a particular species to maintain itself and increase its power, its conception of reality must comprehend enough of the calculable and constant for it to base a scheme of behavior on it. Oh, that's a, almost a little free energy-ish. The yeah. utility of preservation, not some abstract theoretical need not to be deceived, stands as the motive behind the development of the organs of knowledge. They develop in such a way that their observations suffice for our preservation. In other words, the measure of the desire for knowledge depends upon the measure to which the will to power grows in a species. A species grasps a certain amount of reality in order to become master of it, in order to press it into service. During that section of the book, you, uh, you were drawing so many um, parallels between the way Nietzsche thought of nature and the way Whitehead thought of God. And there are, there are so many um th this part at least where i ended here this would be a divergence right the the or yeah would it be a divergence well you know like i was saying earlier with the how close instrumentalism is to pragmatism and whitehead's allegiance to a jamesian sort of pragmatism which is an evolutionary logic where whereby you know the meaning of a concept or an idea is its use, its its use value in actual life. He he accepts that, but with a qualification, um, which is that you know, unlike Nietzsche, Whitehead still has this sense of a primordial nature of God, <laughs> mm -hmm. and and it's not the sort of God that would be. Um, high and mighty and imposing laws from outside but more like dionysus actually involved in the world 
but involved as as the source of an aim that is not the sort of you know singular monotheistic aim that Nietzsche or um, what does Nietzsche say? Um, Monot he, he has this play on words with monotony and monotheism, um, monotonotheism, as he put it. Um, but it's an aim that, yes, is 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 a primordial aim, but it enters into the world through each of the many, inflected by the uniqueness of each creature, rather than imposing itself in a universalistic way on each creature. And mm -hmm. so it's both... Whitehead wants this this aim, this divine eros, to be both universal but also unique, because it only comes through in the experience of of each individual creature, based on that creature's situation, and so it's both um, a unity, but also a plurality. And I think it's like I'm trying to go deep into this dialogue with Nietzsche to show how you get everything you want. Nietzsche in Whitehead's scheme, but he's Whitehead's getting us out of this pathological transition stage um, mm. by by reimagining the nature of the divine ground of reality. Would, would it be fair to say that where Whitehead would say creativity, Nietzsche would say creative ecstasy, and mm. that 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 Dionysian element that's he he gets everything he wants in Whitehead, but that possibilitect or that sense that there's a limiting factor he just always does away with that as like a naive comfort and that it it makes no sense it just goes on it does what it wants because it wants and right. he, okay yeah and because you know whitehead would just say if unless you have some sort of a something <laughs> a possibility informing you and your experience giving you a some sense of relevant novelty or relevance period you 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 couldn't even complete a sentence like where is what's the source of the intelligibility of your own genius Nietzsche like that you would write these things and Whitehead's just trying to recover that and surface the presupposition of Nietzsche's philosophizing even though Nietzsche is you know philosophizing with a hammer and destroying fixed meanings wherever he finds them that's motivated by something what is motivating that and Whitehead's process theology is just an attempt to surface the what's driving this aesthetic um lore that 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 Nietzsche is possessed by right mm -hmm. and so I'm I'm not ultimately I think I'm not ultimately affirming the Nietzschean point of view here because I think it does he Nietzsche got stuck you know um or he he exploded he exploded himself and couldn't put the pieces back together and I think we can learn from his example so much, um, but we need to be able to, there's there's a need for this dose of this more um, gentlemanly, calm, um, grounded pursuit that Whitehead exemplifies. Yeah, yeah. where you, that connects right. Whitehead and Schelling's mobilization of Christian imagery is not the same old, quote, monotono the theism, rightly rejected by Nietzsche. Quote, religion will not regain its old power, writes Whitehead, until it can face change in the same spirit as does science. In Catherine Keller's terms, Schelling and, Whitehead, Schelling and Whitehead's is as much an iconoplastic as it is an iconoclastic theology. Simply put, the alternative mode of thought articulated by Schelling and Whitehead is aesthetically is aesthetically rather than conceptually or morally grounded. They both challenge the orthodox plot of the philosophical soul's journey, that is, transcendental rationality's yearning for disembodied perfection, by reversing the vector of the soul's desire. Their theology is not about a fallen world longing for God, but the story of a lonely God longing for the world. For as Blake said, quote, eternity is in love with the productions of time. So when you say that um, Schelling and Whitehead's mode of thought is aesthetically grounded rather than morally grounded, and we talk about that, that confrontation with chaos and the difference between Nietzsche's Dionysian artistic approach and... Um, 
the more gentlemanly approach of someone like Whitehead or, or maybe Schelling, uh, it's not, it's not bringing gentlemanly morality necessarily to bear on our understanding of the chaos. That would be more Kantian, him trying to do that and that gentlemanly impulse to, oh, it's just, let's, let's not bother. Right. Uh, it's too, it's too messy. Or, or saying that the chaos is evil and should be resisted. Right. You know, right. there's a playfulness in Whitehead <clears throat> that's, you know, willing to, again, like trust that what at first appears to be chaos is just the dawning of a new order. And that if we're really going, going to embrace an evolutionary cosmology, we have to be willing to confront what first appears like chaos. Mm -hmm. And it's just, you know, that Nietzsche was... And th this comes through in a, in, a, in in Gilles Deleuze later, who's a you know major inheritor of uh, Nietzsche. That that there's this sense in which you know Deleuze was so eager to strip naked and go skinny dipping in in the rivers of hell, and not many people can follow him. And what he wants to report back from uh, the river sticks is not immediately digestible by anyone because it's so contrary to our to our common sense and our sense of. Um, moral appropriateness and everything like there's a need for a little bit more translation there mm -hmm. and i feel like um whitehead is <laughs> slightly more accessible and can can help usher people who might otherwise be fearful or moralizing and rejecting this um this point of view to to look again at what appears disordered and chaotic or initially even evil and to just you know, see the twinkle in its eye or see the, the ways in which it's relieving you of something that has grown um, more abundant and, and, and uh, that, that, that the rigor mortis that has set in in any established order needs to, needs to be destroyed, mm -hmm. right? And that, that, that you will survive in that, through that encounter, but you will be transformed at the same time and, you know, I think Whitehead just has a way of articulating all of this that can welcome along those who are more scientifically inclined, more logical um, and mathematical. He, he, he isn't just rejecting uh, science and, and logic and rationality, but, but showing that um, the reality that we're attempting to know is always going to outrun any any fixed system that reason might come up with, but that reason itself is still an expression of this creative ground. If only we could embrace its, its, its aesthetic basis, right? And so for Whitehead, all of our knowledge just becomes a more refined form of feeling. And it's part of what it means to say that, you know, he's aesthetically rooted rather than morally rooted, mm -hmm. um, you know, his, his calm his calm in the face of that chaos is not because he's holding tight to a set of morals it's because he's staying in close contact with that that interplay at the sublime edge that that yeah. in out in out breathing way of apprehending yeah and it's not that he's not saying that the moral good is is irrelevant it's just that there's a in whitehead's platonism there's a good beyond being which is to say a good with a capital G beyond good and evil with lowercase, lowercase G and E, right? Mm -hmm. So he wants to go beyond good and evil as it's perceived in any given historical moment, just like Nietzsche, mm -hmm. and, and would say that Kant was stuck in a particular culture and historical moment sense of what is good. So Kant's moral law is really a pretty Eurocentric Protestant form of, of good um, that requires denying uh, our bodies denying our desires and just aligning ourselves with this command of conscience that, you know, is even love for Kant would not be as a motivation moral because it's, it's not the categorical imperative. It's not this, um, law, which would apply to everyone, regardless of any personal connection they might have to the person that they're doing good for. Mm. Um, and Whitehead is instead saying, what we think of as moral is 
is itself part of this evolutionary process and it will change over the course of time because you know novelty is always ingressing it's just that i think he goes a little bit he wants to hold on to something that nietzsche loses um which is the sense of there being there being a divine judge of the world and that can seem severe but judge in the aesthetic sense judging um as a form of like um making the world whole again like it's not that god is judging from a distance it's that god's aesthetic judgment of the world is what allows it all to hang together as a whole despite you know the proliferation of different possibilities that are always ingressing god's constant nature it, it's what allows it to hang together it it is the hanging together. it is the hanging together yeah okay mm -hmm. okay wow yeah all right i'm going to jump to one 160 uh no um yeah i will jump to 156 in process and reality whitehead explains that quote the primordial non-temporal accident is here termed god because the contemplation of our natures as enjoying real feelings derived from the timeless source of all order acquires that quote subjective form of refreshment and companionship at which religions aim um yeah that makes sense to me the the philosophical imagination can discover the divinity at the base of actuality only after having survived the crisis of nihilism and the deconstruction of all transcendently imposed values when a philosopher is able to think feel and will in full consciousness of the grave implications of her own incarnation, then an actual living God can be experienced. A philosopher whose will has been brought to its utmost extreme. Well, I just want to pause there for a moment. It connects to um, in our very first conversation when we were talking about entering that 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 state wherein there, there's an awareness that it's it's good this is gonna keep going but that not feeling like some um wonderful breaking free from the shackles of death but rather it feeling like oh my god like there's gonna be so many different kinds of suffering there's no uh, escape yeah. there's no escape that's the the those are the grave implications um and and yeah the that they are required as they have to be held in mind if you if you want that um yeah that that experience that this is related to nietzsche's yay saying an affirmation of eternal recurrence right, right. That, not it doesn't have to be the same thing but the same in the sense that like what i call it hurts is gonna that's gonna keep happening yeah what do you think compelled nietzsche to construe it as the recurrence of identical circumstances uh i mean probably his his reading of the greek atomists and you know this the sense that um if if the universe is is infinite and it's composed of you know these atoms that eventually everything cycles back around again and it's just an image he's working with because okay. he, he's... it's the same idea though it's it's that those grave implications don't change very much one yeah way. and it's you know it's nietzsche in the image of the eternal recurrence eternal return is it's less about you know the the philosophy of nature that might be underlying it atomism or whatever but more about the existential implications of being able to affirm your own existence to say yes to life even if you know that there's no escape right and that um that this that you will have to relive the worst experiences over and over and over again it's like but 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 that perspective if you can say yes to that then what's so bad about that experience might not feel quite as i mean he's trying to shift our perspective on on pain and suffering Right, because the horror we're imagining when we imagine that recurrence would be having to contemplate this eternal thing that just keeps going. We're thinking about how this is an injustice uh, being thrust upon us, and that if you right. remove that right. element of self torture, there's still torture, but a lot less. 
he's he's trying to help us discover our freedom and to get out of that um psychological trap of imagining that someone is doing this to me someone that's it that's it so i I feel that when I have intense nausea, when I'm sitting like a, a late night where I can't sleep and my stomach and my head are just thumping, mm. it is so hard to not go to a place of this is being done to me. And I, I I'm, and I, it's worse than like I'm being punished because punishment at least is like, okay, then I can do something differently next time. And this won't happen again. Just the sense that this, this is just built in for no reason um yeah no i i I've, I've touched that feeling but i want to continue on what i the the section i was reading so you said yeah when a philosopher is able to think feel and will in full consciousness of the grave implications of her own incarnation then an actual living god can be experienced a philosopher whose will has been brought to its utmost extreme and who has thus quote stood alone before the infinite as Schelling puts it consciously participates in the becoming of God. Paradoxically, to experience the divine life in all things, the philosopher must learn to die, as Plato suggested, encountering and embracing the sublime mystery while still alive, awakens the embodied soul to the power of imaginative perception, granting it a, quote, metaxic bond with the soul. What metaxic, what's that? Metaxi is a word that um, Plato develops in um, the Timaeus, I believe, that it refers to the sort of being in between and it's it's a way of, the metaxi is a way of talking about our participation in in the forms for Plato. Um, or in Whitehead, it's it's the participation of the forms in in us in a way because you have of Whitehead's inversion of Plato. Um, so yeah, metaxi there would be to say that our individual soul begins to bleed together with the soul of the world. And we start to have this sense of a microcosm, macrocosm correspondence. Okay. Okay. The universe then openly displays itself as an ongoing expression of sublime thesis, an open-ended achievement of the imminent divine aim at play in the world. My body and its ego will die, but the soul of this world will inherit my actions and live on. Eventually, even this world soul will die, and in so doing, it will trace faint echoes of its adventures into the subtly ordered chaos preceding the next world soul's awakening. Quote, from the remnants of a dying, rigid world, there sprouted the seeds of a new one, writes Steiner. He continues, that is why we have death and life in the world. The decaying portion of the old world adheres to the new life blossoming from it, and the process of evolution moves slowly. This comes to expression most clearly in man himself. The sheath he bears is gathered from the preserved remnants of the old world. And within this sheath, the germ of that being is matured and will live in the future. And yeah, so, the, you know, the decaying portion of the world, you could just as easily construe that as the, the evil portion of the world. Like that uh, when we're talking about death here is ultimately creative. It can sometimes be harder to swallow when you're talking about evil in that way, the way we have in past conversations, but it is that that's part of the, the grave implications of the incarnation is that, is that understanding that evil is, is, um, is just as vital as death uh, mm -hmm. to the ongoing procession. Yeah. Um, this is an important theological innovation both in in Schelling and in Whitehead that's different from the way that Christianity has tended to deal with evil um, as just a privation. If you go back to St. Augustine, you know, God's not responsible for evil. Evil is a nothing. Right. Schelling. The, the absence. It's, it's the just absence, the absence of, good. of good in that conception. Right. Sorry, keep going. Whereas what Schelling and Whitehead are saying is that evil is itself a positive principle and that there is a kind of, um, there's an essential role for evil in, in an evolutionary cosmology in any evolutionary picture because it provides resistance. And without resistance, there can be no evolution, no overcoming. And so it, it, there's, a, there's a way in which 
you know, we have to, like Whitehead will say, evil is creativity in the wrong season, in the sense that it's the introduction of novelty in a way that would destroy the settled habits of the society into which it ingresses. Mm -hmm. But the thing is that that disturbance of what has become settled functions as the creative impetus for um, greater complexity in response to the disturbance and, and greater beauty in response to the disturbance. And so it's not that we, therefore, it's not that Whitehead and Schelling are saying embrace evil. <laughs> no, <laughs> resist, resist evil, but recognize that, that it is, it is because of the presence of, of evil in the world that evolution, ev evolutionary creativity is constantly overcoming itself and producing greater beauty. Mm -hmm. and so we, it's like, it's, it's inviting us to, and you know, this is the dominant interpretation in the history of Christianity has been um, privation, evil as privation, but you already see in, you know, in Jesus's statement, love thy enemies, the sense in which, you know, don't view evil as, uh, as satanic, view it as something which must be engaged with. Right. And, it, you know, bring love to it if you can, which again, doesn't mean re don't resist, you know, when, and, you know, Jesus will say, turn the other cheek, but, but that is in a sense of a form of resistance because it's, it's, you're not giving the evil, the opportunity to continue to destroy by you yourself attempting to destroy it. You can't destroy evil. <laughs> if you want evil to go away, you have to create the conditions for it to eat itself, to destroy itself. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's difficult to, to articulate in a way that doesn't sound like um, a kind of, a, yeah, it's an attempt to redeem evil. Um, and, you know, Steiner has his conception of evil as these two different, um, these two different beings, Lucifer and Armin, and like Armin would be, and, and, the good would be to hold the balance between the two extremes rather than thinking you could eliminate one or the other it's like how do you hold the balance between this harmonic impulse which is more like materialism um and the luciferic impulse which is like too much spirituality like just leaving the earth behind and dissolving into your imagination like steiner views the good as this effort to to mediate between these two impulses which mm. are evil only when they come to dominate when one or the other comes to dominate right mm. but they're necessary ingredients in the good because the good is just the, the tension held between them but That's would it. nietzsche would say that that emphasis on the good where we're saying that if you look closely at evil it creates the circumstances for higher forms of the good and then you're not saying, well, if you look closely at the good, it's creating the circumstances for higher forms of evil, too. And, and Nietzsche would probably say, OK, the, the real yes saying is like, I'm actually going to just hold those two and not privilege one. And I'm just going to let evil be just as important or fundamental as good. And it, I, I don't know if we have and maybe examples of someone holding on to that without going mad, but it begs, but he would say that I, I would assume, it, you know, his, his view um, of any philosopher who would, even in the absence of the kind of God he was wanting to get rid of, emphasize some sort of uh, a capital G good, that, that that's just slipping in, the old God, that's, that would be his critique. Um, and, and is there, but when, when we talk about how we need to show up and how we need to cultivate the moral imagination and, and not simply be in the state of like looking at what it is and just letting it be in its isness, but add our own verse that that positive move is that emphasis. It is a decision to emphasize 
the way that that capital G good, it, it almost, it exists. If we decide to emphasize it, we're part of what mm -hmm. is bringing that into being. Yeah. 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 So like, this is Whitehead says, God, the power of God is the worship that God inspires. Right. And so we, in these gestures of, a, of, um, faithful will that, that there is a good brings about the reality of that goodness, right? And it's not something that's just there independent of our participation in it, mm -hmm. right? And so Whitehead's attempt to revamp a kind of theology post Nietzsche, and he did read Nietzsche, but his attempt to reimagine theology in the wake of Nietzsche's deconstruction is calling us to recognize the, the significance of our own participation in that, that it's something that we have to decide freely to bring about. Namely, God's power is only something that we ourselves can realize in the world. And, you know, there's the, the ingredient in each moment of our experience of this sense of um, eros, that, that Whitehead is affirming, but but it's not determining what we do. It's just creating the possibility for us to actualize. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's putting the responsibility back in our hands and saying like, look, if you're gonna, it's not saying don't pray to God, but recognize that prayer is a process of self-formation mm -hmm. to prepare yourself to be worthy of, of the divine. Mm -hmm. by participating in the in the in the incarnation of that divine power mm -hmm. and when you say nietzsche got stuck he it, it was it was failing to take up that mantle of of recognition um of what 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 was being called forth by the confrontation he was having um the that capacity to change the divine um, mm. in your own behavior and orientation to it. Um, I mean, you know, thus spoke Zarathustra as a masterpiece, and it's hard to say that he he doesn't sort of push through in that in that book. But um, you know, and it could just be as simple as the poor guy got syphilis, and right. that you know his brain decayed just because of that physiological issue <laughs> but at the same time he wasn't a happy guy and wanted to affirm you know he wanted to affirm joy he wanted to just dance despite the fact that god was dead mm -hmm. um, but i yeah on some level i think he just was a bit too far ahead of us and was more the harbinger for what needs to be done and couldn't himself do it mm. all right this is the last this is the last uh excerpt i have from this week's reading nietzsche elsewhere imagines a future god whose power comes from becoming with and so suffering alongside finite creatures um sorry a god whose growth quote could make our old earth more agreeable to inhabit his vision of a powerful future feeling that human beings are just beginning to awaken to resonates deeply with Whitehead's sense of the consequent nature of God, God's, quote, universal feeling, inclusive of the world's sufferings, sorrows, failures, triumphs, and joys alike. A tender care that nothing be lost. In Nietzsche's terms, he who is able to feel the history of man altogether as his own history feels in a monstrous generalization all the grief of the invalid thinking of health, of the old man thinking of the dreams of his youth, of the robber, of the lover robbed of his beloved, of the martyr whose ideal is perishing, of the hero on the eve after a battle that decided nothing but brought him wounds and the loss of a friend. But to hear and to be able to hear this monstrous son of all kinds, of grief and still be the hero who, on the second day of battle, greets dawn and his fortune as a person whose horizon stretches millennia before and behind him. 
to take this upon one's soul, the oldest, the newest, losses, hopes, conquests, victories of humanity, to finally take all this in one soul and compress it into one feeling. This would surely have to produce a happiness unknown to humanity so far, a divine happiness full of power and love, full of tears and laughter, a happiness which, like the sun in the evening, continually draws on its inexhaustible riches, giving them away and pouring them into the sea. The, this divine feeling would then be called humanity. So that, I, yeah, I mean, I don't think that was from thus spoke Zarathustra, but that would clearly be a moment where you'd have to say he pulled through. Yeah. Yeah, no, he, he definitely had glimpses, right? For sure. Man. Yeah. And that's just so much like what Whitehead is pointing towards with the consequent nature of God is, um, is this cosmic memory. But there's a way in which, you know, if the primordial nature of God is grounded more in this metaphysical principle that, you know, Whitehead felt he needed uh, to explain the order of the cosmos, the consequent nature of God is more an appeal to what the human being needs to feel to feel real to feel justified in in our own existence we need this this sense of being a participant in that larger story yeah yeah that and that that description of the feeling as well holding all the prior experiences of humanity within yourself um yeah, it's so resonant. I don't, I mean, now I'm questioning where I was about to go with this, which was a reference to an ayahuasca experience where at least I felt in communion with my whole personal ancestral history, which of course branches off into the, goes all the way down to the earth eventually. Um, and th this idea that, well, th those feelings for me at least uh, made it clear that experiences of that elk are, are possible and that. <laughs> from a biological standpoint, it would make sense. I mean, our, our brains are the, the accumulation of experience. We, we are the memory of the past in some sense. And um, so to have, uh, to have felt a, a, a bit of that for a short period of time, it, it, it of course feels unsustainable. Like it's just, it, it, it it's, it is inflation and you know Nietzsche was pro inflation in many ways um but he was also well aware that the average human being and uh, including himself it proved was not d evolutionarily at the point where it could hold that kind of experience uh without buckling and so part of his conception of the ubermensch or like what we were a bridge to as he's saying here is is that being that can hold it all and live with that awareness. And that dovetails perfectly with Whitehead's idea of the body as a complex amplifier. So we're getting more and more amplified and mm -hmm. this thing is seeking intensity of experience. And, and a description like that is an example of the psyche, like pause, putting that out there as an attractor to move toward. He's, he's amplifying us in that very moment. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, Whitehead ends his book, Adventures of Ideas, by describing the divine circulation from primordial to consequent nature as the dream of youth and the harvest of tragedy. And that it's, it's not like this universe has a happy ending, right? It's, it's not like there's any way it, you know, God doesn't come in with this rescue mission and make all the bad stuff go away, but but gives us this depth of feeling whereby the contrast between the dream and the tragedy is just an enhancement of of the aesthetic. It's an intensification of of the beauty, right? Because of the the way that the the failures and the way that death itself becomes integrated and made whole by the larger circle of the process. And so, you know, it's not a they lived happily ever after story. It's, it's a, it's a, it's the story of, of growth through suffering. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right, man. This has been a really, a really good one. And 
Um, Thanks for reading my book, Roman, and reading it with such um, care and interest. Uh, I appreciate it. I have I have another hundred pages, so I'm excited. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for continuing to engage me in this way. It's it's making it a really really enriching journey. So thank you, and uh, I hope we can talk next week. You're welcome. Yeah, looking forward to it. All right, man. Have a great day. You too.